Hi, this is Dr. Mike Chupp, and you are listening to CMDA Matters, the weekly podcast of the Christian Medical and Dental Associations. You know, October has become a membership advancement month here at CMDA, and I've just finished visiting our members and ministry groups in Milwaukee, Chicago, Dallas, Houston, and Waco, Texas. And in each one of those places, I have been so blessed by our members, some of you listening, and all of the things that God has for you and that you are doing in your communities, training up the next generation, reaching the unreached and those uh, who are needy in terms of health care. I was just so blessed. We have a campaign ongoing called the CMDA Thrive Campaign. That is an acronym for the six reasons why Christians in healthcare should join CMDA. Thrive, tools and resources, help a national movement, receive needed support, impact your community, have a voice for Christians in healthcare that's biblically based, and finally, engage with colleagues who are like-minded. Well, today on CMDA Matters, our uh, theme is morality and ethics in today's world. And if you've been following CMDA, as well as our audio resources for a long time, our guest for this week's episode, well, he almost needs no introduction. I'm joined today by the one and only Dr. John Patrick, who continues to be a frequent guest speaker at a variety of CMDA events around the country. In fact, he just spoke at our Midwest Conference fall meeting. He was also a regular guest on Christian Doctors Digest, which was CMDA's audio magazine for nearly 25 years, hosted by our CEO Emeritus, Dr. David Stevens. If you're not familiar with Dr. Patrick, he studied medicine at King's College London and St. George's Hospital London in the United Kingdom. He's held appointments in Britain, the West Indies, as well as Canada. At the University of Ottawa, Dr. Patrick was associate professor in clinical nutrition in the Department of Biochemistry and Pediatrics for 20 years. Today, he is president and professor at Augustine College and speaks to Christian and secular groups around the world. He's been communicating with authority on medical ethics, culture, public policy, as well as the integration of faith and science. I asked Dr. Patrick to sit down with me this week to talk about the courage that we need as Christians in healthcare to have serious discussions within the church, to push back against the culture in order to turn our world right side up. Even if you've heard John in the past, you may not have heard him tell his own story, including the story of his mother, who was so influential in his life. It certainly was my first time to hear John relate this story. This is a fun and long-awaited interview for CMDA Matters, so buckle up and let's listen in to one of CMDA's deepest thinkers, Dr. John Patrick. Will, are you ready for me to give your bio and to jump into this? Yeah, if you want to start with that, that's fine by me. Um, it's um, always difficult to know where to start. But I mean, I'm a sinner saved by grace. That's the fundamental thing. And uh, the reason I'm doing this today is because of grace. Um, there's no question about that. So I'm a blue collar kid growing up. <laughs> Nobody in my uh, family ever went to university before me. We'd been craftsmen on both sides of the family. My grandfather on my mother's side was a, a Rolls-Royce trained toolmaker um, when the toolmaker was the peak of the working class. On the other side, it was a coppersmith who was a drunkard. So nothing illustrious about my, my background, uh, a Marxist on one side and a drunkard on the other. So, but, but, sounds like uh, Abraham Lincoln, Dr. Patrick. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But my mother and father were deeply committed Christians. But uh, my father's family sent him and his siblings to Sunday school. And he grew up in that context. Of course, my mother growing up in a Marxist household had no such thing. And the key for her was uh, when my grandfather wouldn't allow her to take a scholarship for continuing education, said, no, you get out and earn some money. When she was, I don't know, 12 or 13, something like that. So she was working as a seamstress in Birmingham. Now, uh, that was way beneath her abilities, uh, except that 
forever afterwards, she could make anything she could see a picture of. She didn't need a pattern. And she made all my clothes when I was small. She she made it all her own clothes. So she saved my father a mint of money over the years. But by the grace of God, she was put next to a woman who was a real believer and who was smart enough to realize that when you work with people, you don't set out to evangelize them. Uh, they're watching you. And this woman was smart. She just loved it. And in due course, when she'd earned uh, brownie points, uh, she said, we've got some interesting missionaries coming to our church this week. Uh, uh, would you like to come? She said, they're faith missionaries. They've been in Africa for that stage uh, a dozen years without any income. And that, of course, is as far from Marxism as you can get. Mm -hmm. And she had nothing better to do, so she went. And on the third night, she got saved. Wow. Now she had someone to write to. Because these folk who had gone to Congo with C.T. Studd had given up having a family because they felt called to the Achuri Forest. And if they had children, uh, they would have to come back uh, at some point, And they didn't want to do that. Uh, they came back in the end when they were in their 60s because of the Simba uprising. But that, they didn't want to leave even then, but the mission insisted. So when they came back to uh, England on their very rare furloughs, uh, if young people got saved, they sort of took them as children in the Lord. So my mother had someone to write to. And in those days, the mail got to the Achuri Forest, which it doesn't anymore. So they knew when she got uh, engaged, married, and when I was conceived. And I didn't learn until some 40 plus years later hmm. that from the day they heard that I was conceived, they put me on their daily prayer list. Wow. I mean, when you're a faith missionary, you spend three hours in prayer every day. And I was in that prayer time. And they had three prayers for me, that I would become a Christian, I'd become a doctor, and I'd go to the Belgian Congo. <laughs> did you end up in the Belgian Congo? I did, yeah. Yes. Um, I mean, the first was reasonable, because the best way to become a Christian is to be loved into the, the church by your family. That's the safest way. And not to depart from the way that you've been brought up. It's not so exciting to talk about, but it's the best way. And I had that. So I never went to school without the Bible being read to me, for instance, every day. And my mother was a superb Bible teacher, although she had no education. She could hold a class of 50 kids with no trouble because she was a brilliant storyteller. And she could bring the stories of the Bible to life for the children. Um, so I didn't. I thought every mom could do that. Of course, years later, I learned that was not so. The second prayer that I would become a doctor was ridiculous because the street where I grew up... Uh, in Birmingham, one boy had gone to university before me in 30 years. I was the second. I was the only one who became a doctor. 400 houses. Not likely to happen, but it did. Uh, I got a scholarship, which I didn't understand, to one of the best schools in England, a uh, school where Tolkien had been a student a generation before me. An amazing place. So I got a superb education there without knowing what was happening to me. I was somewhat bemused, but not overwhelmed. And then I went off to medical school and played truant frequently because my passion at that point was rock climbing rather than medicine. And I just looked at the things I was never going to do, like orthopedics. I, I never set a fracture in my life, never went on orthopedic rounds, never went to an orthopedic clinic. I knew I could learn from the textbook enough to pass, which is all I needed. Uh -huh. And in the end, of course, I, I was made for that kind of life. And uh, I never left the university. Uh, I went from one specialty to another, and at various ways along the route, I tried to escape into my own foolishnesses, and every time God used somebody to stop me. The first one was my first boss in internal medicine, who learned uh, a year after I left him that I was thinking of going on a, a cruise around the world uh, as a ship's doctor, and he found me in the corridor and said, you're not doing that. Uh, that's a total waste. Um, you go and do neurology at Oxford, I'll arrange it. And in those days, that kind of paternalism was accepted, and I did what I was told. I had met my wife-to-be before that as a student, and she turned up in Oxford, and that's where we got engaged. If you had brought me up on a charge of being a Christian at that point in the workplace, it would have been difficult to prove the, the case. My faith was very private, and that was despite the fact that I'd listened to people like John Stott and Martin Lloyd-Jones, most Sundays for five years as a student, I, I liked hearing really good sermons. Mm -hmm. 
and I can still remember some of those sermons. And in the States, I've had the lovely phenomenon of somebody coming up. I remember last time this happened, it focused on the Family Physicians Conference. And after the, the sessions that I'd done, I did the, the devotionals for that particular session. And a guy came up behind me and tapped me on the shoulder and said, just like being in the chapel, he knew immediately where I had been trained, so to speak. He uh -huh. could recognize the imprint of Martin Lloyd-Jones. And uh, I'd said it, it, during that week that the most important person for me had, in terms of teaching had been Lloyd-Jones. That's lovely. Uh, I mean, the man could preach. He preached three hour-long sermons uh, a week. One on Friday evening was a Bible reading. And in, in five years, we got through one chapter of Romans. And it was never boring. That's what we've lost. That's what drives me now. As years later, I came to realize that I had received wonderful gifts and I'd been keeping them to myself. The students who were hungry picked up, even in biochemistry lectures, throwaway lines. I only had to teach a couple of courses because I brought money into the, uh, into the university and I published a lot. So the dean let me do what I liked. They'd recruited me. They weren't going to not get what they wanted. But I had to do six weeks of biochemistry in the medical course. And I would say to the students immediately, look, frankly, this is a waste of time. You will not remember anything of biochemistry except perhaps the Krebs cycle. And that's of no value whatsoever, since you'll never meet a patient who doesn't have a Krebs cycle. No Krebs cycle, you're dead. The biochemistry that I do now on children is so obscure, it, I wouldn't dream of trying to teach it to you. Uh, I can recognize a metabolic disorder, and then it takes me six weeks to find out what it is, and often involves sending bits of liver halfway around the world before we get the answer. Well, John, um, I'm just delighted that you have given our listeners and me your background. And I just want to know how did, because Dr. Stevens never shared this with me, how did you and Dave Stevens and CMDA intersect? When did that relationship, I'm guessing it's close to 25 years or maybe longer. It was in the 1980s, actually. And students were the proximate cause um, what happened was those students, the, the smart ones, very rapidly moved to the front row, uh, not so much for the biochemistry as for the throwaway comments. And then one of them came and asked me, are you actually a Christian? And I said, well, yes, I believe this story is true. And I acknowledge I don't show it very much in my life in the university. And he said, there are four of us in first year who want to get through medical school with our faith intact. Will you help us? I was about to say, no, I'm too busy, when my mother turned up at the back of my head and said, you could do that, you ought to do that. Mm. So I said, all right, I'll, I'll do four weeks, and you better come to my house at 8 o'clock in the evening when you've done a bit of studying so you don't feel neurotic, and we'll see where we go. The sad part was I didn't need to do any preparation uh, because they were biblically illiterate. But it, I didn't do four weeks. I did 10 years before I got too busy doing other things, courtesy of David. At about the same time, the Faculty of Education sent a missive around the university saying teaching in a modern university should be from a morally neutral position. And I was so angry. Steam was rising. There is no such thing as a morally neutral position. It simply does not exist. So uh, I sat down on my computer and I wrote a paper in the next three hours. Uh, it was only a short one, about 12 pages, I think. And uh, I sent it to the then... Uh, executive director of the Canadian CM, CMDS, and he published it without my permission in a little journal, Focus, which goes out, and I think about 2,000 copies per issue, you know, it, it's tiny. And I said, Bob, it was to read for your comment, not to publish. He said, oh, the guys will love it. It's good. And to my astonishment, that little paper went around the world. And somebody asked me to give it a recording to make a recording of it, although they didn't ask me, they recorded me talking about it without me knowing. And somehow that recording got into David's hands, uh -huh. I think by Mike McLaughlin. And then he'd just come back from Africa not long before. And uh, he called me in Ottawa, uh, tracked me down and said, uh, I've just listened to a talk of yours half a dozen times. I don't normally do that, but it's the first thing I've come across that helps me to begin to realize what my job is, because I realized once I took over that 
CMDA was a fellowship organization, but it wasn't doing what was needed in, in the sense of giving Christian doctors a real sense of how that all fitted together. And he said, what you have to say is the first thing I've come across that makes sense. Because he said, I'd never thought what you point out in that talk, that tolerance is not even a virtue. Tolerance is the, the liberal elite's way of getting their own way. To say you're intolerant means that you have to climb down unless you're me. And you say, really? Yes, I am intolerant and you should be too. Can we discuss what intolerances are appropriate and which are not? Now, Christians can't do that on the whole. And yet you could rewrite the Ten Commandments as the Ten Divine Intolerances. Mm -hmm. It's quite easy to do. I mean, when God gives the law to the children of Israel, he, he makes no bones about it. He says, these are what I will not accept you doing. And if you don't obey me in this, your culture will collapse. And of course, frequently it did. And they went away for uh, decades or centuries and then repented and came back. Being Jews, they get a second bite at the cherry. Other cultures appear to get one bite at the cherry. And as might be over now, I don't know. Well, about three years ago, I don't know if you remember, Dr. Patrick, we were in California, Southern California together, Riverside, California Baptist University at a missions conference. And I was, it was yeah, during- I remember one, that, yeah. And you, you came up and, and sat next to me. It was the first time, I think, uh, since Kenya, when you were a retreat speaker for, for our mission. I remember that very well, too. But you kind of whispered in my ear, if ever there is an opening, an opportunity, I would love to write a column for the CMDA magazine. And <laughs> you did. You did. And so I came back and I talked to our editor, uh, Mandy Morin, uh, and I just said, hey, John Patrick sort of volunteered. What do you think about this? And I think Mandy's eyes brightened up. And I think the rest is history. Uh, it took a little bit, bit for us to get started. But uh, I'm, I'm actually looking at your fall article entitled yeah. Turning the World Right Side Up. Talk to our listeners a little bit about what you wanted to accomplish in that editorial in case they haven't read it yet. What is driving me is that the church is not passionate. Basically, it's a social club in terms of its structure and the way it behaves. And I mean, so many people who've gone into ministry are basically doing therapy. Jesus didn't do therapy. And we need to change that. And the one command he gave us all that applies to everyone without exception, go and tell what the Lord has done for you. And the answer is nothing in most cases that, that, that we actually recognize as such. Of course, he'd done everything, but we don't recognize it. The easiest place to see how, that, how getting this right would change us is to think about church on Sunday morning. When it comes to prayer time, it's basically a shopping list. Who's going to hospital? Who's got this problem or that problem? Paul isn't interested in that shopping list. He's interested in how you got saved this week. 1 Corinthians, uh, first chapter. How are you being saved is what he's about. Now, if the pastor said, I want at least once a month prayer time to be about witness to what the Lord has done in your life. I mean, that's what Jesus says. Go and tell what the Lord has done for you. Everybody can do that, even in our PC world. And when you do that, it carries its own conviction. Now, if you don't have anything to say, then you've made your first step, which is, oh, I better repent mm -hmm. because I need to be able to tell what the Lord has done. I need to think about my life that way. I mean, the verse that's been coming up in my sleep and all over the time over the last year or so is from the, the parable of the vine. Uh, without me, you can do nothing. Mm. I mean, he doesn't mince his words, nothing. So uh, from my point of view, it both makes it easy and makes it hard. But I have over the years had plenty of occasions in which I have had that wonderful experience, which I'm sure you've had too, of realizing, hey, what's going on at the moment is really nothing to do with me. This is pure gift. Mm -hmm. But he wants us all to have that. And when that happens, the church becomes so different from everybody around us. Around us, we have a whole culture that is obsessed with triviality. 
I mean, you think of what they watch on their screens, Instagram, and and looking for a thumbs up as though that is meaningful. You know, it, it it's it's rubbish. It, it's trivial. It's materialistic. It's hedonistic. It goes nowhere. And that's why Jordan Peterson is amazing because he understands that, and he's trying to make life more meaningful. And guys, in particular, are responding to it. I mean, the, the Twelve Rules for Life. Uh, I was just thinking this week and, and playing with it as a, a, an article that anybody who is really brought up in the church doesn't need the trial rules for life because it, you can find every one of them in the Bible already and they should have entered into your soul before you were thinking when we had Sunday schools that really worked. So that's what drives me. And so writing that column, uh, I'm always wondering, how can I get under their skin? <laughs> <laughs> and and you got under my skin because you say we're not having enough controlled discussions, basically serious, even heated discussion. That's what the church ought to be about, you say, you write. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, my favorite quotation in that direction is one that I think I've put into that, that those articles already. It's from John Milton. He says, where there is a great desire to know, there of necessity there must be much argument for argument amongst good men is but knowledge in the making Mm -hmm. if your church isn't a place where people argue it's dead there ought to be argument going it ought to be civil but it should be very intense when peter and paul went at it about the role of judaism in the new church that wasn't an easy conversation but it was important and when somebody corrects you instead of taking offense, which is the modern university thing, and all the students do it, you should say thank you. I mean, the best thing that can happen to you uh, to make a good day is when somebody corrects you, because then you've made some real progress. I mean, I always try to do that when a student asks a question that stops from my checks. I say, thank you. That's a good question. I haven't had one that good for a long while. Thank you. That's who we should be, people who argue freely and vehemently and to get at the truth. That's the way we're meant to do it. Well, and certainly in the med- in, in our medical and surgical disciplines, it seems that we are brought up that way. You go to a conference and there's a panel and I'm for this, I'm against this, and it's fairly civil. And that brings me to ask you this question, Dr. Patrick. I've been wanting to ask you this for some time. We're all about assessing uh, evidence-based medicine out Outcomes and outcome measures, they've been a bedrock uh, for evidence-based medicine. So it seems to me that we have a field, a professional field, where we should be able to talk about outcomes. And in this whole transgender tornado or tsunami, whatever you want to call it, it seems like we do have a position from which to argue based upon science and outcomes. Would you agree or not agree? Uh, Partially agree, but not agree totally. That's one of our biggest problems, is that we don't know how to talk about the things that evidence-based medicine can't talk about, and yet we need to talk about. Science can only deal with what can be measured. If it can't be measured, they can't deal with it. Now, you can't measure love, you can't measure loyalty, you can't measure truth. Those things matter. No, so at the heart of medicine, it's not evidence-based medicine. You only have to look at the people who started it. They came from my country, and most of them were left-wing and reductionist. And that's what they produced. And, of course, the whole failure of the COVID management is that it did precisely that, except that they thought that all the science that mattered was contained within epidemiology. Mm -hmm. Well, it wasn't. I mean, we now know that the kids who've been in high school and university during the lockdown have already lost three to five percent of their lifetime's earnings because of the way we did it. The European Union's economic commissioners have said that. Uh, And you can find it if you're interested in a conference that took place at uh, Stanford in the Hoover Institute not so long ago. No, they got it wrong. And we now know that the, the deaths during COVID, but not from COVID, actually are greater than the deaths from COVID Mm. in many, many subgroups, certainly in the young. We broke our own rules about testing new vaccines uh, before we used them, and we were wrong. There's going to be a lot of uh, stuff going through before this comes out in the wash, but I hope it will. So I'm all in favor of evidence-based medicine for what it can do, 
but don't confuse it with being adequate for the whole of medicine because it's not right the first and most important thing you need from your doctor is that you trust him and trust comp is another of those immeasurables uh, but without it nothing happens you can't you've been a missionary can you translate the te techniques of western medicine into africa often not no no, because they have a, an intellectual background. It's not an accident that evidence-based medicine and experimental science only happened in one place in the whole, whole world, and that was Europe. Because to do an experiment, I, I had to go to Africa to learn this and realize that the work I'd done with malnutrition was not translating, was not translatable. And, of course, the reason was that I was talking to people whose basic questions were not answered by the, the Christianity that they've just moved into and they've had marvelous conversions, but by their pagan background. So they were fatalistic. When you've seen a nurse drop a needle on the floor and pick it up and put it in a vein, you know that they're fatalistic. And they don't see that, well, they, they, they do things for us, not because they... They have actually bought into the whole process. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I came to start looking at where this all went wrong. And I now, if I'm asked to talk about this and given the time, I would start at the very latest in the 13th century. If you don't start there, you won't understand wokeness and transgenderism and all the rest for what they are, which is heresies in one form or another. And as Lewis put it a long while ago, most heresy is a good thing in a wrong place. So uh, it's good to take account of people's feelings, but they mustn't trump reality. That's not actually being kind to people, is it? People who say, I don't want to have a needle. We, we say, yeah, we've got to find out what's wrong with you. We, we don't back down on that one, quite rightly. So uh, we've lost our way. The ancients understood what medicine was about because they had no treatment. I mean, until the 1860s, going to the doctor was more likely to end in your death than not going to the doctor. Till the 1860s. So why did people go? They went because they knew there was something wrong and they needed to know what it was and what was going to happen. And from Hippocrates onwards, doctors steadily increased their knowledge of prognosis and they recognized the natural history of disease and people went and you must have had this experience in Africa where someone comes to you and the classic one even in Jamaica was someone coming from the north coast uh, basically a subsistence farmer who saved up enough money to come into Kingston and come to the the university hospital where I did one clinic a week and uh, uh, because they knew there was something wrong with them but they didn't know what it was now, one of the common things that would turn up there would be cancer of the liver. They had two things going for that. They, they grew peanuts, and often that had mold on them, so aflatoxin was there, and they drank too much uh, rum. So now when you examine such a person, if you could hear a rub over the liver, you knew that there was something growing in the liver that was rough enough to rub up against the, perit uh, the peritoneum, and the, the only thing that is is cancer. So you didn't even need to do any tests. If you're a decent clinician, you take the history and everything fitted. So then you had the task of telling them this good news and bad news. The good news is that I know what's wrong with you. Uh, the bad news is that there's not much we can do about it, but I can explain to you why. And the astonishing thing to me was at the end of that interview, almost invariably, they said, thank you. Because now they knew what they had to do. Their life was not going to go on so much longer, so they needed to reconcile with all the people they were not reconciled with and sort out their affairs. I had that happen over and over again, Dr. Patrick. Course, that yes. they, they can't, sometimes they would come to Tenwick Hospital because they said, you'll tell us the truth and we can deal with the truth because you'll tell it here. Yep. But now uh, you get into trouble with many of the people trained by the social sciences. But... We're losing our, our trust. Isn't it amazing that in the Western world that our techniques and our abilities to do things have gone through the roof and our standing in the public eye has gone through the floor? Why? It's because we're not trustworthy anymore. And this is across the whole of our culture.
a few years ago, around 2000, uh, I was at the University of Chicago doing Grand Rounds, which was uh, a, a bit of a surprise because I was past my sell-by date as a trendy scientist at that point. And it turned out it was a God thing, but there isn't time to go into that. Anyway, uh, I was honored and I said yes. And the secretary called me and said, uh, thank you for saying you'll come. Uh, we booked you into a nice hotel near the University of Chicago, um, the best medical school, I think, in the country, uh, or one of them. Grand Rounds is not just an hour. They have you for two or three days and they milk you for everything you've got. <laughs> and it's, it's fun. But she said, uh, I said, well, you can unbook me because uh, I don't like hotels and I've got a good friend in Southside. She said, that's the most dangerous bit of the city. He said, he'll look after me. Anyway, um, they also said, is there anyone you'd like to meet while you're here? Because they're very proud of their university. I said, yes, if you can arrange it. I would love to meet Robert Fogel. And she said, well, he spoke to, he did Grand Rounds not so long ago. So I think he'd, he, that could be arranged. And she arranged it. Now, Robert Fogel was a Nobel Prize winner. He died two, three years back now in economics, in the world's most famous department of economics. And somebody, probably a CMDA member, had sent me a copy of his book, The Fourth Great Awakening. And sadly, I didn't write in the flyleaf who sent it to me. So I've never been able to thank them. So if they happen to be listening, please write to me so that we can have a conversation. But in that book, here's a secular Jew left wing, grew up in New York, lived in Chicago all his life. And he's writing a book about awakenings. And what had happened was he'd done one very un-Jewish thing. He'd married a black Episcopalian lady. And she had died a little while before. And he missed her deeply and realized she was the reason he was proud of his children who were not following in his footsteps. But they were doing good things and he was proud of them. So he wrote the book in honor of her uh, and to deal with what he'd missed out. And what he realized was that she had taught his children to be people of their word. They were trustworthy. And he understood watching his own class in the world's most famous department of economics around 2000, before it happened, he predicted there would be a catastrophe, which happened in 2008. And the graduates of that class would be responsible on both sides of the equation, the government side and the banking side. And both were failures of trust. Mm -hmm. And his thesis is basically the, the commodity that will determine whether America continues to succeed will not be technical. It will be whether we have enough people who are trustworthy. And being a good Jew, he did it intellectually. He, he asked himself the question, in the 18th century, when America was getting going, it was behind Europe in every category of activity. And it remained there until really the First World War. But he said, here we are, two and a half, three centuries later, leading the world. How did that happen? And he went back and he realized we have a lot to thank the Puritans for. He understood that Massachusetts and the Puritans had set ethical standards, which have only been going down since then. I mean, it is a bit upsetting to us as evangelicals that Alabama, which claims to have more born again people than any other uh, state, has about 60% of them on some form of pension. That's corruption. Uh, and their divorce rates are horrendous. Where Massachusetts, who thinks they've got over God, still retain the ethos which goes back to the Puritans in that they don't have huge divorce rates, they have low divorce rates. So they marry seriously, especially the upper crust. So they've kept the culture while lo losing the belief. So it will, it will fall apart. Fogel knew about Whitfield, who was a good friend of uh, oh, who's Benjamin Franklin uh, in the 18th century. He even knew about Finney in the 19th century. And there around 2000 talking about this, he said, I'm hopeful that something is happening now. And I said, I think you're right, because far more young people are now asking serious questions than ever before. And that's only increasing. The fact that Jordan Peterson has millions of followers because he's asking serious questions is not an accident. Mm.
So we're, we're and but we're not there to ask the questions because we don't know them ourselves. We have become ignorant. I mean, when America started in Massachusetts, decent pastors would have a working knowledge of Greek and Hebrew. When did you last have a, a pastor who had a working knowledge of Greek and Hebrew? Our standards have just dropped. And when I, I visit Christian homes in the States, I, I always look at their bookshelves and because it motivates me because their bookshelves have got very little of high quality on them. We behave as though Paul says at the end of Romans, you've got to be renewed in your feelings, but he doesn't say that. You've got to be renewed in your mind, and the only way you do that is study, as Paul says to Tim Timothy. Read seriously. In your article, Dr. Patrick, since you mentioned that, I had to chuckle. You said, if you've not yet read Rodney Stark's book, For the Glory of God, then just put this magazine down and order it now. What's so special about Rodney Stark's book? I'm going to plead ignorance here for the glory of God. Well, what's special about it is that, first of all, Rodney Stark came to faith through intellectual activity as a sociologist and interested in religion. And uh, what he's done in that book, especially the chapter on God's handiwork, is he, as he became Christian and he discovered, he thought he'd discovered that Christianity was far more important than Christians realized. And then he did his homework and found that the standard text on the early, early science before modern science uh, is David Lindbergh's The Beginnings of Western Science from the University of Chicago Press, but it's a thick book. And when he got it, he realized that what he was trying to write was uh, basically a precy of David Lindbergh. Uh, and he said, but I'll go on because all the people in my specialty, sociology, don't know anything about this stuff. Whereas, I mean, it's 25, 30 years, people who do the philosophy and history of science, uh, if you go to a conference of serious people in that area, they, they would agree to a statement like this. Yes, it is true that the church was not a perfect patron of science, but let's be honest, it was the only patron of science. <laughs> it didn't happen anywhere else. We got mathematics, yes, the Greeks got there and made some wonderful progress. But experimental science, which is what really has changed the world, requires that you believe that under the surface chaos of life, there must be order. Now, only Christians have a reason for doing that. An African who believes that everything happens because of evil spirits, he's never going to do an experiment. I mean, what an incredible, stupid thing they would think to say, I can do an experiment in my hut in the middle of Africa and somebody can do the same experiment in London and get the same results. Different evil spirits, different results. The next hut won't even give the same result. And that's, paganism explains that. Evil spirits actually make more sense of life in Africa than Christianity does at first sight, because God is not in a hurry. He knows where he's going and where we're going, but pagans don't have any of that. So when I began to realize this and started to do what God obviously intended me to do in due course. The, the first year we went to Africa, uh, I went because missionaries asked me to go because of what I knew about malnutrition and the fact that it wasn't working there. I knew it wasn't working. I was following the literature and I didn't know why. And I set up a pro program to try and understand more and help to pediatrics. But then I discovered the missionaries couldn't even run their own Bible study. They were so exhausted. They would listen to tapes from America uh, for their weekly uh, sort of Bible study uh, and it was dead and I said can't you do a Bible study on your own that is interesting and they said could you I'm sure I can do that and that was the best thing I did and thereafter then the Africans discovered that I, I love doing that sort of thing and very shortly they, they didn't want me to waste my time seeing patients <laughs> can you imagine that they wanted you to help them with their spiritual care, is what I'm hearing. That's right. Uh, Medicine Sans Frontier can look after the patients, they said, but we don't have anybody who can teach like you. We've reached the end of, I think, the time we're going to be able to have for this interview. But I just, I wanted to tell you a personal story, because you were a retreat speaker, a missionary retreat on the coast of Kenya several years yes. ago. 
I think we received one of probably uh, a, a hundred different John Patrick scoldings that various audience have received over the years. <laughs> And I specifically remember the scolding that this tired group, I think it was our first evening, we had gathered together after a long trip from Nairobi to the coast. But yeah. you would ask us I, probably what was a very basic question to you about the Psalms, and we could not answer your question, the group of us gathered. And uh, you said, what's wrong with you missionaries? What is wrong with you? You don't know the Psalms. And so I took that as a, like one of my surgical attendings when I was a medical student, and they told me I was dumber than a box of rocks. And uh, that, <laughs> that motivated me to dive into the Psalms. And you said specifically, John, you should have a favorite Psalm, a different favorite Psalm every year and, and yes. meditate on that Psalms. I want to thank you for the kick in the behind that you gave me a few years ago, because I have fallen more in love with the Psalms than ever before. Oh yeah. And the older you get, the more you love them. Can I say one thing about Augustine before we close? Oh, please do. And then I want you to tell our listeners about your new podcast. Oh, okay. Well, those two things. First of all, COVID has really hurt us because American students couldn't cross the border and you were half our students. Um, that was only the start. Now, as I recognize talking to students, high school students have been robbed of their joie de vivre. I mean, when you're a teenager, you know your parents got it all wrong and you're going to put the, the world to rights. Now they're just flat emotionally. We can't teach them in the way we used to. We're having a year off this year, and I don't know what's going to happen next. I know that the program that we had has produced superb results. I mean, the kids who take the course have a much higher probability of coming out of university with their faith intact uh, than those who don't have that background, who know where ideas came from. Uh, although we've had only 250 or so students over a 25-year uh, period, uh, we produce a, a couple of doctors every year out of that, uh, the odd lawyer. Uh, we've got several PhDs, including one or two doing extremely well. So for a first year class, we have extraordinary uh, results. Uh, but that's that's obviously a selection bias because we take kids who are smart and want to learn more. But now we don't know what to do. So we need your prayers, first of all. Yes. The, the, the Physicians Conference that we've been running for about 17 years, and it's an extraordinary conference. I mean, we, we've had people who come for three times through the program without missing a summer. That's 18 years. We've only got one left now who hasn't missed since we started. Uh, he comes every year. He says, I, I live for the rest of the year on the conversations I have during this week. Uh, we need to do it in the States as well so that people don't have far enough to follow. And if we're not going to be doing uh, undergraduates for the moment, then maybe that's something we can do. And we need people to help us by inviting us. So I certainly had one guy who's been up a lawyer and he said, if you put this on at somewhere like uh, the Mayo Clinic area, you get 200 people turn up um, if they knew about it. So we've got to rethink. I mean, the the docs have kept us going during the show. They don't they don't want Augustine College to die no matter what. But we can't do it with the current output from high school. We probably do it with homeschoolers, but they are so proud of what they've done. They take a few years to realise it's still not enough. So I don't know what's going to happen. Uh, I'm waiting for the Lord to tell me. Uh, we certainly need a replacement for me. So if any of you know that God is telling you that you need to do something like I'm doing, this is a way in. Uh, and we have uh, American friends of uh, Augustine College. So that means you've got charitable deductions within the U.S. And we should start somewhere in the States as well. We tried in, in uh, Blacksburg, Virginia. And what we learned from that is you need the people who are going to teach to get to know one another for two or three years before you try. You can't, they need that much time. So we need reading groups. Parents, you know your kids are facing a terrible future uh, at the moment and you want it to be better. Well, you've got to start showing them what to do by having serious reading groups that prepare you and prepare them. Uh, invite me and someone else perhaps to come with me and do a long weekend in your church uh, so that we can talk about these things and perhaps help you to get going. So, well, Dr. Patrick, in about at. in about in maybe in about sixty seconds, because uh, many of our listeners have been your fans for years. 
been following you, uh, your podcast. You have a weekly podcast just like CMDA Matters. Yeah, um, that was started by Craig Flood, who called me and said, I owe you because you've had an impact on my life. I heard you speak once when I was just finishing high school in a doctor's home, and it changed my life. And so he said, the trouble is when I listen to your talks, I want to shout, stop. <laughs> I, I, I want to think about that, and I want you to help me to think about it. So what he's trying to do is to get me to unpack rather more than I usually do. And that's what we're working on. We haven't, we haven't got there yet, but... Um, it's called the John Patrick Podcast? Do, Dr. John Patrick on, on Apple will take you to, to podcasts, and you'll find me. We're trying to do one a week, which we're doing so far. Well, for our listeners, uh, it's one of the reasons I like your editorial, because I can do just what the, your friend shared, that I can stop and say, now what in the world does that mean? Um, I read about tacit knowledge in your editorial, and I had to think about that a little bit by Leslie Newbig. And so uh, yeah. it, our listeners, uh, this is going to be a regular feature. We've had it now for several issues. It's going to continue there, but either John Patrick or or one of his friends. But Dr. Patrick, uh, thank you for being one of the most influential voices advocating for an informed, rational, and reasonable defense of biblically based ethics and morality at CMDA for 30 years. Thank you for all you do. We appreciate you. And I appreciate what you do. CMDA has transformed my life. Wow. So thank you. That's that's awesome to hear. What a moving and inspiring comment there at the end by Dr. John Patrick, that God has used CMDA over many years to play such a transforming role in his life. I'm glad that John took a few minutes near the end of our conversation to share with us about the work he's doing at Augustine College. If you're not familiar with it, Augustine College offers two distinct programs that aim to help students grow in wisdom and in virtue by exploring the riches of Western culture. Students there live together, they work together, they eat together and pray together as part of a broader community of professors, alumni, and friends of the college. Through engaging discussion, communal worship, and rigorous study, students there are meant to experience a meaningful encounter with Christ. For more information, please visit augustinecollege.org or you can find the link in our show notes today. You can also connect with Dr. Patrick at johnpatrick.ca. His new podcast is available on his website, along with some of his writings and other presentations. I hope that you will take a few minutes to check that out. We mentioned his new regular column in uh, the CMDA Today magazine, a bioethics column. You can read that column by going to cmda.org slash cmda today to get caught up on his recent contributions there. They are always intriguing, and they encourage me to think about these hard topics in new ways. While you're there, check out some of the recent editions of our magazine to learn more about what's happening across CMDA. The magazine includes inspirational testimonies from fellow Christian healthcare professionals, public policy updates, glimpses into the future of healthcare, and examples of how you can integrate your faith into your practice and much more. Please don't forget about our CMDA bookstore. You can find a variety of recordings from Dr. Patrick in our online store, in addition to a wealth of resources to encourage and equip you as you incorporate your faith into your practice. One of the resources I specifically want to mention to you that actually came to my mind during this interview is Dr. Farr Curlin's book, The Way of Medicine which he co-wrote with Dr. Christopher Tollefson. In this book, they asked the questions, what is medicine and what is it for? What does it really mean to be a good doctor? Answers to these questions are certainly essential, both to the practice of medicine and to understanding the moral norms that shape our practice. The way of medicine articulates and defends an account of medicine and medical ethics meant to challenge what the authors refer to as the, quote, provider of services model, end quote. In this prevailing model, clinicians eschew any claim to know what is good for a patient and instead offer an array of healthcare services 
for the sake of the patient's subjective well-being, the authors call for practitioners to recover what they call the way of medicine. It is a way that offers physicians a path out of the provider of services model. You know, it also gives us the moral resources necessary to resist the various political, institutional, and cultural forces that are constantly pushing today medical professionals and our patients into thinking of our relationship in terms of an economic exchange. You can purchase your copy today in the CMDA bookstore by going to cmda.org slash bookstore. Those of us who serve in the healthcare professions have the best opportunities without question to point individuals toward Christ. One of our big priorities here at CMDA is to help train healthcare professionals to integrate our faith into our practice of healthcare. That's why we produced Faith Prescriptions. This on-demand video series will teach you to share your faith in ethical and appropriate ways with colleagues and your patients. It'll teach you to pray with patients and much, much more. To get started with the series, which is free to our CMDA members, you can visit our CMDA Learning Center. Go to cmda.org learning. Before I close today's program, here's our new voice on CMDA Matters, Mrs. Jamie Majeski, with an additional important announcement. If you have a heart for missions and you want to learn how to live missionally in your life in the U.S. or around the globe, then we encourage you to register now for the Global Missions Health Conference. This year's event is scheduled for November 10th through 12th at Southeast Christian Church in Louisville, Kentucky. And when you get there, be sure to look for the CMDA neighborhood in the exhibit hall. We'd love to introduce you to a variety of ways you can use your skills to serve others. Visit cmda.org slash events for more information. I'd like to invite you to join me right back here next Thursday for a conversation with Dr. Omari Hodge and Dr. Joy Walton, who are both members of CMDA's Red Committee, which stands for Racism, Reconciliation, Equality, and Diversity. They joined Bill Reichert and me to have a much needed discussion about how we as Christians in healthcare, well, we're called to address racism and existing healthcare disparities in our society today. As always, if you want to suggest a future guest for the podcast, you can just email us at cmdamatters at cmda.org. And if you like the podcast, be sure to give us a five-star rating and share us on your favorite social media platform. During my conversation, Dr. Patrick asked a specific question that I want to bring to your attention one last time. He said, what wonderful gift have you received that you are keeping to yourself? That question can speak to each one of us in different ways because we've all received different and wonderful gifts from the Lord Jesus. The Apostle Peter told us that each one of us should use whatever gifts we have received to serve others, faithfully administering God's grace in its various forms. I hope that this conversation with Dr. Patrick inspires you to start using your gifts from God as ways to bear witness to the Lord Jesus and his love. As John said, when you do that, it carries its own conviction. And when you do that, you will be bringing the hope and healing of Christ to the world around you. That's what matters to CMDA and CMDA Matters. I'll be looking forward to seeing you right here next week on CMDA Matters. Bye for now. This podcast has been a production of the Christian Medical and Dental Associations. The opinions expressed by guests on this podcast are not necessarily endorsed by the Christian Medical and Dental Associations. CMDA is a nonpartisan organization that does not endorse political parties or candidates for public office. The views expressed on this podcast reflect judgments regarding principles and values held by CMDA and its members and are not intended to imply endorsement of any political party or candidate.